Now, uh, while in Form 1, we looked at um, the differences between physical changes and chemical changes. And we did say that uh, during a chemical process, energy is either gained from the environment or lost to the environment. And that's where we want to pick up from. What is this environment that we talk about? <clears throat> if you look at this illustration, if A and B are reactant particles, then the environment is the need immediate surrounding on the two particles where the thermometer has been placed. And therefore, if energy is, is being lost uh, from this uh, reaction to the environment, then the temperature of the immediate surrounding will rise. And therefore, if there is a rise in temperature, then we say that reaction is exothermic. On the other hand, if you look at reactants X and Y reacting and energy is being absorbed from the environment, it means the temperature of that environment will drop. And that, that means <clears throat> this will be an endothermic reaction because energy will, be have, will have been lost from the environment to uh, the system. For any particular reaction, the energy change in a reaction is given by the energy content of a product minus the energy content of the reactants. As illustrated here, where delta H is the heat of reaction, uh, HP is the energy content of products, and HR the energy content of the reactants. And therefore, if the energy content of the products is greater than that of the reactants, then if you substitute in this expression, you'll get delta H being positive. And that means for an endothermic reaction, uh, there is indeed a drop in temperature because the, 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 the products will have gained energy, meaning <clears throat> the products will, be, will have more energy than the reactants, so delta H will be positive in value. Uh, similarly, where the products will have less energy than reactants, implying that energy will have been lost from the system. Uh, if you substitute in this expression, you'll realize that delta H will be negative, will have a negative sign. Uh, that means where there is a rise in temperature, the reaction is exothermic. So those two conditions will be able to tell you whether a process is endothermic or exothermic. The same information can be illustrated on what we call an energy level diagram, where on the y-axis we have the energy content of other reactions or products, on the x-axis we have the reaction path. Now, if the reactants have higher energy than the products, meaning energy has been lost to the environment, then this is going to be the energy level diagram for an exothermic reaction where the reactants have a high energy compared to the products, meaning delta H will, be, will have a negative sign. Uh, similarly, for an endothermic reaction, energy has been gained into the system, implying that the products are now having more energy than the reactants, so delta H will have a positive sign, and this is for an endothermic uh, reaction. Next, we look at uh, a thermochemical equation. A thermochemical equation is basically a normal equation with the energy change at the end of it. It's a combination of the two to show us whether a, re a, 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 a reaction is endothermic or exothermic. And therefore, the way we treat the other normal equations in terms of understanding or in terms of calculations is the same, same, same way we can treat a thermochemical equation as illustrated in this example where two moles of hydrogen gas are combined with one mole of oxygen gas to produce two moles of water or steam with 576 kilojoules of energy released. You can be asked to calculate the amount of energy given out when, for example, one mole of hydrogen gas 
is burnt in excess oxygen. So the mole ratio we use to calculate in other normal equations will also apply. In this case we say if two moles of hydrogen gas give us this amount of energy, what about one mole as shown here? If two moles of hydrogen gas produce this amount of energy, what about one mole? And you get that amount of energy. Uh, we can also calculate uh, in using the molar gas volume concept how much energy would be given out if this volume of hydrogen gas is burnt in excess oxygen. The working is the same. From the equation, you realize that two moles of hydrogen gas give us this amount of energy. And we know that uh, from the molar gas volume concept, one mole of any gas at STP occupies 22.4 liters. Therefore, if two times this give us 576 kilojoules, what about the volume required in the stem of the question? And that gives us 1.44 uh, kilojoules. So the way we treat the normal equations in terms of calculations and interpretation and understanding is the same, same, same way we treat uh, this thermochemical equations. I've given a follow-up question here. I would like you to look at it and we can share on the platform uh, the answers that you get. Uh, you're given sulfur foxide gas combined with oxygen to give you sulfur 6. You asked to draw the energy level diagram for the reaction and uh, further calculate the amount of energy produced when this mass of sulfur foxide is burnt in excess oxygen given this uh, uh, con uh, information over there. Next we want to look at what we call standard enthalpy changes. Usually abbreviated like this uh, delta H with that sign over there. Uh, we call it the knots. Now what are standard enthalpy changes? These are enthalpy changes or heat changes and uh, by the way, the word enthalpy and energy and heat sometimes are used interchangeably. So we can say standard enthalpy changes or standard en energy changes or standard heat changes. Now these are heat changes that occur under the following conditions. One, when one mole of substance is involved, the particular substance that is taking part in the reaction, and then two, when the conditions available are standard temperature and pressure conditions. So once you have a reaction taking place under these two conditions, then the energy change produced in that reaction will be a standard energy change. At this level, we shall discuss the following standard enthalpy changes. One, heat of solution. Two, <clears throat> heat of neutralization. We also have heat of displacement, heat of combustion, and sometimes we have heat of precipitation. Uh, I will discuss some of these uh, enthalpy changes and my colleague will also discuss uh, the rest during his presentation. I'll start by looking at empirical or experimental determination of some of these energy changes. Remember we said you when you have one mole of a substance reacting, then you provide STP conditions, you can easily get a standard enthalpy change. So that means we can experimentally determine any of these standard enthalpy changes. Now, what are the general steps involved in such experiments? You have to determine the standard enthalpy change of any given uh, reaction. One, you need to know the quantity of the substance reacting. That means you need to measure the quantity of the substance you're using in that particular reaction. <clears throat> Number two, you also need to measure the quantity of the substance absorbing the energy because you need to know how much energy will have been absorbed and that means that energy would have come from the reaction that is taking place. Uh, how do you know the amount of energy? The temperature changes. You need to know at what temperature was 
the reactants, the initial temperature and the final temperature and that will give you the change in temperature. After determining all those, we use this relationship, delta H is equals to MC delta T to work out the amount of energy uh, either released or absorbed uh, during uh, the process where M is the mass of the substance absorbing energy. And take note here, this is the mass of the substance absorbing the energy, not the mass of the substance reacting. And then C is a constant, what we call the specific heat capacity of water. Um, and then delta T is the change in temperature, and it must be in Kelvin. And remember, for you to get delta T, it's final temperature minus initial temperature. After getting the delta H, remember, standard enthalpy change involves the amount of energy released when one mole of the substance is reacting. So it is important to consider point five. You must know how many moles of the substance were reacting. And thereafter, you use the moles of the substance reacting to get how much energy would be produced if one mole was involved. And that's what we call standard uh, enthalpy change. Um, I'll look at the first example, heat of solution. I've taken you through the, 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 the general steps of carrying out the experiment, assuming the experiments have been carried out and we have certain data. We start by defining what is heat of solution. From the conditions we gave earlier, remember we insisted on the quantities and then the conditions. Therefore we are saying this is the heat change or enthalpy change or energy change when one mole of a solute dissolves in excess water until there is no further change in temperature under standard conditions. As long as you include the quantity being one mole and you are saying the reaction is going to completion and you specify the conditions, that definition is accurate enough. We do have an example here where <clears throat> ammonium nitrate is involved. We are adding 0 0.8 grams of ammonium nitrate in 100 centimeters cubed of water. The initial temperature was 24.0 degrees centigrade and um, the temperature dropped to 22.0 degrees centigrade. Remember we said um, during a chemical process energy can either be lost or gained, in which case temperature can rise or drop. That will tell whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. We are required to determine <coughs> the heat of solution of ammonium nitrate. That means how much energy would be given out when one mole of ammonium nitrate is dissolved in water. Water is the common solvent. These constants are usually given the density of water. First of all, why these relative atomic masses? Because you always need to know how much moles, how many moles you are using. Why density of water? Because it is assumed that at the end of the reaction, the solution formed will have the same density as that of water. C is a constant. So always use the information given in such calculations. And the working <clears throat> is as shown. We start by getting the, the mass of water using the volume of water and density, multiplying the two. We get the change in temperature. Remember, change in temperature, uh, the units do not affect uh, the value. Uh, if it's negative, ignore, don't substitute in the expression, but put that at the back of the mind because it will tell you uh, the kind of reaction taking place. Um, so you substitute in this, and I want you to take note here. The value of C given was 4.2 joules per gram per Kelvin, and therefore the mass should remain in grams. You substitute in this expression, you get that amount of energy, 840. Don't stop there. 
move further to get how many moles of ammonium nitrate were involved from relative formula mass and the mass of ammonium nitrate given you divide the two that will give you the number of moles of ammonium nitrate that are involved then you say if those moles give you that amount of energy what about one mole remember at the back of your mind you remember the reaction was endothermic and that's why you put at the sign uh, positive 8400 joules per mole or you can still convert this into kilojoules per mole uh, for your practice uh, there is a question here for you to do either as individuals or in groups where we are determining the heat of solution of sodium hydroxide pellets and this data was recorded the mass of the pellets is given there volume of water used the change in temperature here we've given you direct the change in temperature um, you are asked to get the heat of solution of sodium hydroxide given this contents i mean a uh, constants uh, please try it out the next enthalpy change we want to look at is heat of displacement <clears throat> we know what displacement is all about this is where you are displacing ions from a solution in most cases using a metal i know we also have displacement reactions involving halogens but in in this case we are looking at displacement reactions involving metals and metal solutions so from that definition of the word displacement heat of displacement is therefore the heat change or enthalpy change when one mole of ions are displaced from their solution under standard conditions remember to specify that we're using one mole and the reaction is taking place under uh, standard conditions stp to illustrate this we have an example here where we are having uh, excess ion metal uh, being added to a solution of copper two sulfate actually 200 centimeters cubed of one molar at this temperature this is the initial temperature and the highest temperature reached was 31.5 degrees centigrade so we want to know why did we use excess iron filings in this experiment this is part of the experimental work then we determine the heat of displacement um, in this particular case then we shall also try to compare supposing we use another metal like magnesium instead of iron metal how will the heat of displacement compare and then finally because this is an experiment we shall want to ask ourselves what are some of the errors sources of error um, uh, th these are conditions that may affect the answer that we get uh, from the calculations and how can we minimize how can we reduce the errors so that we get a more accurate uh, answer now to the first part <clears throat> why do we use excess of the metal remember we are displacing copper ions. so to ensure that all the copper ions have been displaced then we use excess of the metal then given these constants just like we saw we can be able to work out the mass of water the mass of the solution because in this case it is the solution that is absorbing the heat energy so we need to know the mass of the solution we were given a volume of 200 times density that gives us a mass of 200 grams then we work out the delta t subtracting final minus initial you get 6.5 kelvin uh, you substitute in delta h is equals to this i want to emphasize something here this is m C was given to us as 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Because it is in kilojoules per kilogram, we must convert the mass into kilograms by dividing by a thousand. So you substitute and you work out to get 5.46 kilojoules. 
we want the heat of displacement. We want to know how much energy would be given out when one mole of ions. So we need to know how many moles of copper ions were displaced from the volume and molarity. These are the moles of copper ions that were displaced. So we say, if these moles produced that amount of energy, what about one mole? It is always with respect to one mole. So you work out, and that gives you a value, 27.3 kilojoules per mole. Remember, a reaction is either endothermic or exothermic. What determines that? Whether there is a rise in temperature or a drop in temperature. In this case, there was a rise in temperature. The reaction is therefore exothermic. You must indicate that by showing the negative sign. Now, in part C, we wanted to compare. Supposing we use magnesium instead of iron metal, what would be the effect on the final answer? <clears throat> and we are saying, because magnesium is more reactive than iron, then there will be a larger change in temperature. And that means the heat of displacement will be greater when magnesium is used compared to when iron is used because of the difference in reactivity uh, between the two. And finally, we wanted to know what are some of the sources of error in such experiments. Indeed, all experiments uh, on energy changes, the main source of error is this one. There is always some heat lost to the environment through the apparatus that we use. Some of the apparatus even absorb uh, some of the heat and that affects the final answer that you get. How can we minimize that error? That's why we mainly use plastic, or we call them polystyrene containers, because plastics do not conduct a lot of uh, heat. Or we do what we call lagging, where you're given some material that does not conduct uh, heat, uh, like cotton wool, to wrap around the apparatus that we're using for such experiments. That is aimed at reducing the heat loss to the environment to ensure that you don't incur so much errors in your experiments. I followed it up with a, a question where in this case we have given you the exact amount of zinc that is being used in a reaction to displace also an exact amount of copper ions from copper to sulfate solution. Remember, in the first case, we gave you excess ion. But in this case, we've given you an exact amount of the metal that is being used to displace, to displace uh, copper ions. Um, the questions are basically the same. I would like you to try it out and we share on the platform so that we see how we are reacting to the same. The constants are as given over here. Now, we have discussed some standard enthalpy changes, but I want to make it clear here that we have some other energy changes which cannot be determined experimentally. Uh, they are, we, they, they, they are theoretical in, in the sense that you cannot carry out an experiment to determine that energy change. An example is, as far as your syllabus is concerned, heat of formation. And what is heat of formation? What, are, what, what is formation in the first place? In terms of chemistry, to form a substance, remember it's not to prepare, it's to form. You are assuming that you are combining the elements present in that substance directly. That is what we mean by formation. And therefore, heat of formation is the heat change when one mole of a substance is formed from its constituent elements, the elements that are there in their physical states under standard conditions. Heat of formation Remember, one mole is still coming out here. So we are saying is the heat change when one mole of a substance 
is formed from its constituent elements in their physical states under standard conditions. Remember you said it is kind of a theoretical concept because it cannot be done experimentally. So we are therefore saying, <clears throat> if you're talking about formation of calcium carbonate, the assumption is you'll take calcium, add it to carbon, add it to oxygen, and that will give you calcium carbonate. Realistically, that is not true. If you want to form <clears throat> ethanol, Again, you ask yourself, what elements are present in ethanol? We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Therefore, formation of ethanol will involve, according to this concept, you're taking carbon, add to hydrogen and oxygen to get ethanol. In all cases, we are forming one mole. And that is why you realize we are now balancing with fractions to ensure that we end up with one mole. The same to ethane. So these are examples to show you what we mean by formation. You are assuming that for you to form something, you take the elements present, combine them directly, that will give you uh, the product. Now, because we cannot carry out these uh, experiments in the lab, one now wonders, how can you determine, for example, the heat of formation of ethanol? Yet you cannot carry out a reaction involving formation experimentally in the lab. How can you carry out, how can you determine the heat of formation of ethane? What we do, we apply a concept called Hess's law. Because heat of formation cannot be determined experimentally. You can't, there is no experiment to do to determine heat of formation. Then you apply his law. How do you apply his law? You combine other standard enthalpy changes that you can determine experimentally in what we call an energy cycle and they come up with uh, a way of determining such an energy change that cannot be done experimentally. Hess was some scientist who discovered this and in the process he solved that problem and the Hess law states that the energy change in converting reactants to products is the same irrespective of the path or the routes followed. I will repeat, he looked at a given reaction and ask himself, how can I 